Hey guys, it's Friday. We made it through another week. Let me adjust the screen, hang on. Okay, that's a little bit better. Well, Quinn has now had a conversation or two with Nick. Uh, they did see each other at the beach while she was shooting baskets and his brother Tommy offered to give her a ride, but she declined, which her new little friends at school thought she was crazy to do. Hopefully you've been thinking about and trying to infer what we think are going to happen next. You know, is she going to just be friends with Nick? Will they end up being boyfriend, girlfriend? You know, same thing with Tommy, her older brother. Will they be just friends or girlfriend, boyfriend? Chapter six. While Mo was getting Julia settled at the kitchen counter with his after school snack and his headphones, Quinn was curled up on the couch with her phone. She entered the username Lissa had scrawled on a napkin during lunch. Goals 24QB. Unlike Quinn's Instagram account, which was set to private, this one wasn't. One tap, and there he was Nick Strout standing on the sand in his navy blue swim trunks holding a football. Quinn wasn't sure why she was surprised to see him like this. It wasn't like after her hair fell out, she'd suddenly started posting selfies of her bald head. In fact, all the pictures she had posted in the past year had been of inanimate objects, her basketball, the mountains outside her house in Boulder, anything but herself. So Quinn got why Nick wasn't exactly dying to post a picture of himself in a wheelchair. Still, it was hard to reconcile the Nick from study hall with the image on her phone. Instagram Nick looked like a different person, not just in the beach picture, but in everyone that followed. Nick grinning with two other guys in football jerseys, Nick grinning in front of a bonfire, Nick grinning in a suit and tie, his arm around Ivy, who was wearing a short red dress. Nick's photos had dozens of comments, hundreds of likes. Quinn sat there staring at all those pictures thinking, what happened to you, Nick Stroud? Well, she knew what had happened to him. It was a snowmobile accident, but she found herself wanting to know more. She found herself Googling Nick Strout, Goldshead, Massachusetts. And here was what she got. North Shore, Goldshead Middle School quarterback Nicholas Strout was announced Friday morning as the Bay State Junior Sportsman of the Year. Strout was presented with the award in a surprise announcement on the WHGH Channel 5 by former Boston College quarterback Ryan Barker. It's pretty crazy getting a plaque from a guy I idolized when I was little, Strout said. I grew up watching Barker play. It's pretty cool. Strout, an eighth grader at GHMS, went 237 of 348 this season for 3,603 yards and 44 touchdowns while throwing just five interceptions. He led the Seagulls to the state D3 semifinals where they fell to Tewksbury Middle School 37-34. At the presentation Friday, the 13-year-old phenom credited his brothers, former Gulls Head High School quarterbacks Gavin and Christopher Kip Strout and current JV quarterback Thomas Strout and father Mark Strout with teaching me everything I know about football, Strout said. My dad was my first coach. He put a football in my hands when I was three, and I've basically been throwing TDs ever since. So a phenom means he was out of this world fantastic by the time he was 13. So that kind of gives us a little bit more insight to maybe mentally how he's feeling about losing his legs. If he was this phenom football player, I mean, you kind of need your legs to play football. I'm not being mean or anything. It just gives you kind of a mental picture of how he might feel losing his legs and not being able to play. Then Quinn pulled up something else, a GoFundMe page entitled Nick's Fight, dated May 19th. Dear friends of Nicholas Strout, we are writing with an update not only on Nikki's progress, but also on our campaign to raise funds to support him in his rehabilitation and recovery. As you are aware, Nick suffered, suffered a crushing injury while snowmobiling on March 29th and has since undergone bilateral above knee amputation. By means two, Lateral means across, so both 
lateral legs amputated above the knee. Legs laterally above the knee. Any amputation is life altering, but those with bilateral above the knee amputations faced a host of complicated physical and emotional challenges. With your help, this GoFundMe campaign has raised nearly $8,000. Thank you so much for your support and generosity so far. On behalf of the Strout family, we could not be more grateful. The post went on to explain everything Nick would need going forward. Short prosthetic legs with training feet, full length prostheses with micro processor controlled knees or computerized legs. Then came the costs, 2000 for the basic components of each prosthesis followed by prosthetics fees of $10,000 and $15,000 per leg just for the basic models. The advanced computerized prostheses controlled by muscle movements would cost upward of $70,000 per leg, only a portion of which would be covered by the Strout's insurance. $70,000 per leg? Quinn's wigs were nothing compared to this. Hang on, guys. She didn't bring it back yesterday, so... Okay. She wondered what Nick's parents did for work. Most of the houses in Goldshead were pretty small. Did they have savings? Would they need to take out a second mortgage? This is what Quinn's parents had done with Julius when he was accepted at the Cove. They remortgaged their house in Boulder and rented it out to pay for his school. Quinn wasn't supposed to know, but she'd overheard them talking one night, maybe a week before they moved. What about Quinn's college, her mom had said. And her dad had said, we'll figure it out. And her mom had said, I don't want her to have to pay back student loans like I did. And her dad offered up one of his gems. Improvitis opto quad victim. Improvise, adapt, overcome. Looking at Nick Strout's GoFundMe page, Quinn wondered how he was improving, adapting, and overcoming with the whole I no longer have legs situation. There had to be an online support group for amputees, right? If there was, if there was alopeciasucks.com, maybe there was amputationsucks.com. She tapped on Google again. Wait, was it creepy that she was doing this? Was she being a total freak show? Ivy and Lissa had cheer practice after school. Carmen had field hockey. What did Quinn have? Her extracurricular activity was Googling a boy she barely knew and searching for imagery, sorry, imaginary websites. She needed to get a life. But first, real quick, she'd hop back on Instagram and follow Nick Strout. She'd send follow requests to Ivy, Carmen, and Lissa, too. This wasn't being a stalker. This was being a normal person. Also normal, completing her geometry worksheet, reading three chapters of realistic fiction, and putting away her laundry. When Quinn walked into the kitchen at 5.30, her father was standing at the counter slicing tomatoes, which confused her. Dad? He looked up and smiled. Salve, Fila. Greetings, daughter. Salve, Quinn said. Why are you home so early? No one signed up for office hours. I caught the 420 train. Thought I'd help your mom with dinner. Oh, he held up a slice of tomato. Cupus? Yeah, okay. Julius was sitting at the kitchen table with his headphones on, humming to himself and holding a bunless hot dog. Now Quinn was doubly confused. It is Thursday, right? Last I checked, her dad said, arranging tomato slices on a plate. Is he planning to put that hot dog in a thermos? Julius ate only out of a thermos on Thursdays. Thursday thermos. It was an alliteration thing. Quinn had no clue how his brain came up with this stuff. Normally, he chose food that made sense in a thermos, like oatmeal. Shh, Quinn's dad said, sprinkling salt on the tomatoes. I'm trying something new. That was when Quinn's mom marched into the kitchen holding one of her clay busts. Look at this, she said. Quinn looked. The head had appeared to have been scribbled on with a blue marker. Every single one, her mom said. Every single one. She turned to Quinn's brother, Julius. Of course he couldn't hear her because he had his headphones on. Another mom might have raised her voice or yanked the headphones off her child's head to get his attention. Not Mo. She knew that if she startled Quinn's brother or touched him in the slightest bit, he would flip out. Buddy, Quinn's mom knocked gently on the table. She motioned for Julius to remove his headphones. I'm listening, Mo. Indigo dreams. 
Indigo Dreams was a CD Quinn's parents had bought that was supposed to help her brother stay calm during transitions. It was not the weirdest thing they'd ever done. Back in Boulder, they had tried all sorts of alternative therapies. They had taken Julius to this woman who claimed to remove toxic metals from autistic kids' bodies by playing different wavelengths of sound while they were sleeping. The first time Quinn's parents had tried it on Julius, he immediately started wetting the bed. So they moved on to Chinese medicine. Acupuncture, acupressure, aligning the hemisphere of Julian's brain, Julius's brain, which didn't seem to do anything. Next came the naturopath who told Quinn's parents to eliminate casein and soy and gluten and all red foods from Julius's diet. If you ask Quinn, that was the reason he was so hung up on food. Right now, he was clutching his naked hot dog and looking around the kitchen. Where's my thermos, Mo? Quinn snuck a glance at her dad, who said casually, We'll talk about your thermos in a second, kiddo. Right now, look at Mo. It's already been a second, Phil, Julius said, looking at his hot dog. A second has passed. Two seconds have passed. Julius, Quinn's mom said, Thermos Thursday, Mo. Yes, I know it's Thermos Thursday, but I need to ask you a question. She lowered the clay bust to the table. It was one of her better works. Strong Roman nose, full lips, delicate ears. Did you draw on this head with a marker? Limited edition Sharpie brand color burst fine point permanent marker, Mo. Jet set jade. You drew on this head with a Sharpie, Quinn's mom said. You drew on all my heads with a Sharpie? Not your head, Mo. You have hair. Julius was rocking in his chair, forward and backward, forward and backward, eyes on the hot dog. I see. No, you don't, Mo. You don't see your hair unless you look in a mirror. Your hair is above your eyes. It was hard to argue with Quinn's brother's logic. Julius, Quinn's mom took an audible breath. Audible means you could hear it like, <sighs> let it out slow. What's the rule about Mo's studio? I don't go in Mo's studio. Did you go in Mo's studio? Quinn's brother didn't answer, just rocked. Julius, her mother said softly, you drew on my art that I worked very hard on. You drew on it with permanent marker. Limited edition Sharpie brand color burst fine point permanent marker, Mo. Jester Jade. Jet set Jade. Oh, dear God. Where's my thermos, Mo? His body was picking up. Julius, Mom said, you're rocking. I would like you to stop rocking and look at me. Quinn didn't know how her mother stayed so calm. Her art had been vandalized by her nine-year-old. It was crazy. Quinn would laugh if the situation were not at least partially her own fault. If she hadn't gone bald before his very eyes, she doubted that her brother would have done what he had. His heightened awareness of hair was the reason he had defaced Mo's sculptures by giving them all Sharpie wigs. Quinn was sure of it. If you look at me, Julius, I will give you a sticker for eye contact. See, I have your chart right here. Now Quinn had to laugh. She really did. Her mom was holding up a piece of poster board pointing to a box with a pair of eyeballs on it. Thermos Thursday, Mo. How about this, Jules? Quinn's dad said. He walked over to the table with one of their blue ceramic bowls. Why don't you put your hot dog in here? That's not a thermos, Phil. That's a bowl. Quinn didn't know how her brother could see the bowl between the rocking and the hot dog squeezing. His peripheral vision was impressive. Peripheral is what you can see out of the side. So I'm looking straight at you guys, but I can see desks and the board and stuff out of my peripheral vision. It's like a thermos, Quinn's dad said. See, you can put food in it. Your hot dog will fit nicely. Fit perfectum. Phil, Mo said. She gave Quinn's dad a look. If there was anything Quinn's father prided himself on more than spouting random Latin phrases, it was reading Mo's cues. Gotcha, he said. He grabbed two tomato slices, handed one to Quinn, and gestured with his head for her to follow him out of the kitchen. Good luck, Mom, she said. Mo gave Quinn a tired smile. Thanks. Bye, Julius. Just once, Quinn would like for her brother to look at her in the eye and say something that made sense, like, see ya, or later, alligator. But all she got was, Thermos Thursday, Mo, directed at the hot dog. Quinn followed her dad into the living room. When he sat on the couch and patted the space beside him, she sat. Komodo Eret Dias Tuis. Quinn looked at her dad. Phil's eyes were the blue of a swimming pool. His beard had a chunk of tomato in it. Can we please speak English? He nodded. Sure. How was your day? That's what he meant. Fine. Quinn's phone pinged from the pocket of her shorts. When she reached for it, her dad said, 
Can we please hold off on the devices? Sure, Quinn said. Back in the kitchen, Julius was really revving up. Thermos Thursday, Mo, Thermos Thursday. The new plan's really working, huh, Quinn said. These things take time, her dad said. Quinn's phone pinged again. Let me just check this real quick, she said. It might be about homework. Go ahead. Quinn glanced at her phone. Instagram now. Nick Strout, goals 2-4 QB, accepted your follow request. Instagram now. Nick Strout, goals 2-4 QB, requested to follow you. Huh, Quinn said. Homework? No, she slid her phone back in her pocket. It's just this boy. Her dad cocked an eyebrow. There's a boy? It's not like that, Quinn said. He just wants to follow me. Follow you? On Instagram. Ah, as if Quinn's dad had a clue what following someone on Instagram meant. Phil had yet to enter the 21st century. He still had a flip phone. Half the time he forgot to change it. What's this boy's name? Nick. Nick, Quinn's dad repeated. Tell me about Nick. He's just this kid in my study hall. And? And, Quinn said, there's tomato in your beard. She said this because it was true, also because she wasn't sure how much she wanted to tell her father about Nick Strout. He doesn't have legs. He's kind of a jerk. Right you are, her dad said, plucking a chunk of tomato from his beard and popping it into his mouth. Classic Phil. I don't want a sticker, Mo. Julius hollered from the kitchen. I want a thermos. So much for your sticker system, Quinn said. Her dad smiled. He reached out a long, thin hand and squeezed Quinn's elbow. What, she said. Tell me more. More what? More anything. I've only been in school for two days. There's not much to tell. Fair enough, her dad said. He shifted his gaze, not very subtly, from Quinn's eyes to her head. She knew he wanted to ask about Guinevere, but he didn't know what to say. I'm fine, Dad. The wig's fine. I'm just not wearing it right now because it itches. I have to take breaks. Breaks. I have to let my skin breathe. Right, he nodded. That makes sense. Quinn's phone pinged again, then again. Um, Dad, go on. He waved his hand through the air. Go be a teenager. Grab yourself a hot dog. Instagram, seven minutes ago. Nick Strout, goals 2-4 QB, accepted your follow request. Instagram, seven minutes ago. Nick Strout, goals 2-4 QB, requested to follow you. Instagram, three minutes ago. Ivy Darcy, Poison Ivy 710, accepted your follow request. Instagram, three minutes ago. Ivy Darcy, Poison Ivy 710, requested to follow you. Quinn didn't respond to Nick's request right away. She accepted Ivy's follow and browsed through Ivy's photos. Ivy in a cheerleading skirt on top of a pyramid, Ivy in a cheerleading skirt, leaping through the air. Ivy smiling cheek to cheek with Lissa. Ivy smiling cheek to cheek with Carmen. Ivy smiling cheek to cheek with Lissa and Carmen. And then Quinn was surprised to see this. About 50 pictures of Ivy and Nick. Ivy and Nick in front of a fountain. Ivy and Nick making monkey faces. Ivy and Nick kissing. It was weird to see because, well, wasn't there some kind of post-breakup protocol Weren't you supposed to erase all the evidence of your ex-boyfriend after you dumped him? Maybe deep down, Ivy still had feelings for Nick. Maybe she wanted to make future boyfriends jealous. Whatever the reason, Quinn couldn't look away. She scrolled through every photo of Ivy and Nick. When she got to the end, she tapped out of Ivy's page. A second later, she got Instagram now. Goals 2-4 QB sent you a direct message. Quinn tapped on the mail icon. Goals 2-4 QB. QB. Why are you following me on IG? Quinn tapped out her reply. Why not? Right away, another ping. Goals 2-4 QB. IDK, because I'm a jerk? You know, IDK, I don't know. Quinn let this answer sink in. When she didn't respond right away, she got this. Goals 2-4 QB. I haven't been very nice to you. I'm sorry. Quinn thought about all the people in Boulder she would love to hear those words from like John Kugler, who once ripped the baseball cap off her head in the middle of an all-school assembly and started a game of keep away. And Mr. Davy, who saw her scalp shining in the light and everyone laughing and did nothing. And Sammy Albee, who posted the picture of Quinn on that one stupid night with the caption, ha ha, look what I got. Not one of them had ever apologized, but there was this one guy Quinn had known for two days already telling her he was sorry. She looked at the words and she imagined Nick Strout sitting in his wheelchair, frowning down at his phone with those dark, dark eyes, 
waiting for her reply. And she wrote back, a real jerk wouldn't have apologized. Okay, so sometimes it's hard to apologize in person, but sometimes behind a screen it might be easier. At least he apologized for being a jerk. Chapter 7. Three weeks into school, Quinn's mom made her appointment at the Shoreline North Medical Center. I won't be at lunch today, Quinn informed the girls during PE. I have a checkup. <clears throat> Ortho, Ivy asked. It was a logical guess. Quinn's classmates seemed to get pulled out of Gulls Head High School all day long for orthodontist appointments. <clears throat> Excuse me. But Quinn, whose teeth were naturally straight, didn't want to lie. So she said, doctor. That was the truth. Quinn was getting a checkup and she was seeing a doctor, just not a pediatrician. She was seeing a dermatologist like she had seen Dr. Hirsch back in Colorado. Once when her hair first started falling out and then again six months later. Unlike Dr. Hirsch, Dr. Kuderka of the Shoreline North Medical Center was a woman. She had flowing brown hair, and she didn't wear a white coat. She wore jeans and a lavender t-shirt that read, Dermatologist by day, cat lover by night. Nice to meet you, Quinn, Dr. Kuderka said, holding out a hand for Quinn to shake. Nice to meet you, too. Quinn sat, at the, sat on the crinkly paper of the examination table, bareheaded. Excuse me. Mo sat on a chair in the corner, holding Guinevere in her lap like a small dog. So, Dr. Kuderka said, glancing at the clip, her clipboard. You noticed your first bald patch 15 months ago? Quinn nodded. 429 days, but who's counting? And it took about eight weeks for the hair to fall out completely? Yes. Have you noticed any regrowth since then? No. Let's take a look, shall we? Dr. Kuderka flicked on the light that hung down from the ceiling like a spider's leg. She put on a pair of magnifying glasses, just like the ones Dr. Hirsch had worn. She peered at Quinn's scalp. After a minute, she said, I don't see anything. You don't? Not yet, no. Not yet, Quinn's mom repeated, so there's still a chance the hair could grow back? That's the good news about alopecia areata, Dr. Kuderka said, removing her glasses. It's cyclical. No matter how widespread the hair loss, most hair follicles stay alive and are ready to resume normal hair production whenever they receive the appropriate signal. The appropriate signal? Quinn wondered what this was, but didn't ask. She'd been sending signals to her hair follicles for over a year now. She had been speaking to them softly, grow, grow, grow. She had been singing to them sweetly. The course of the disease, Dr. Kaderka continued, is different for everyone, but we have every reason to hope that Quinn's hair will grow back. We just can't predict when that will happen or how long the regrowth will last. I see, Quinn's mom said. I know it's frustrating, Dr. Kaderka said, but all we can really do at this point is wait. We, Quinn thought, like Dr. Kaderka was planning to sit around all day with Quinn and her mom, the three of them watching Quinn's hair follicles hibernate. I'm sorry, honey, Mo said, as soon as they were alone in the room. It's okay. I was hoping, Mo's tr voice trailed off. I know, Quinn said. It's fine. She pulled a roll of wig tape out of her pocket. She ripped off a piece with her teeth, then another. After three weeks of dealing with Guinevere, Quinn was practically an expert. Do you need some scissors, Quinn's mom asked. No, it felt good to use her teeth. It felt good to rip and tear. You don't have to go back to school, Mo said. We could go out for ice cream. Like Quinn was still a little kid, like ice cream could fix anything. Sure, Quinn said, slapping the wig tape onto her, head, onto her scalp with unnecessary force. Would you like that, honey? I said, sure. On their way to the lobby, Mo's phone rang. She glanced at the screen before answering. Sabine, is everything okay? Sabine was a name Quinn had been hearing a lot lately. Sabine says to focus on the positive. Sabine says to play on the schedule. Sabine says to set small, measurable goals. Can you hold on a sec, Sabine? Mo said to Quinn. She whispered. Oh, sorry. Could you hold on a sec, Sabine? Mo said. To Quinn, she whispered, it's Sabine from the Cove. Like there was another Sabine. She has to talk to me about Julius. Here. Mo rifled through her purse and came up with a tin. Why don't you find the cafe and get yourself something to eat? I'll join you as soon as I'm finished. Fine, Quinn said, taking the 10 bucks like everything was cool. Who cared about ice cream? Who cared about Julius ruling the world? Sabine, Mo pressed the phone to her cheek. What's going on? 
If the Shoreline North Medical Center had a cafe, it was in some top secret location Quinn didn't know about. She wandered from floor to floor, radiology, pediatrics, obstetrics, health and wellness. There was no food to be found, not even a vending machine. Quinn didn't really care. She wasn't hungry anyway. She was too busy thinking about her stupid bald head. She didn't want to think about it, but she was. And as always, thinking about her stupid bald head made her think about that one stupid night and how it had ruined everything. In the weeks that followed, Quinn kept thinking it would blow over. She would wake up each morning and say to herself, today will be different. Today, Paige and Tara will act normal. Today, the girls on my team will forget what happened and we'll go back to just playing basketball. Quinn kept waiting for someone to text her, to show up at her locker, to ask her to hang out after practice, but nothing happened. Life as Quinn McAvoy had known it was over. In the course of one night, she had become Pluto, a has-been planet to dwarf-like and unimportant to hang out with the other celestial bodies. She never mentioned this to her parents. Once they were having dinner, Mo looked at her across the table and said, are you okay, honey? You seem tired. Quinn had almost said it then. I've been downgraded, mom. I'm Pluto. She had been about to open her mouth when Julius noticed a green pea in his mashed potatoes and flipped out. White Wednesday, Mo. White Wednesday. Fast forward six months. The morning Quinn's parents loaded up the U-Haul to make the trip from Boulder to Goldshead. Quinn ran into Ethan Hess. Of course she did. It was Murphy's Law that on the same day she was moving away, she would bump into the one person in the universe she least wanted to see in the soda aisle of Lucky's Market. She hadn't wanted to see him, yet there he was reaching for a Dr. Pepper. And she wasn't about to let this moment pass her by, so she headed straight for him. That's what liars drink, huh? Ethan looked up surprised. Quinn, oh, now you know my name? What? You heard me. He looked so stupid all of a sudden, standing there with his floppy hair and his too long, too low shorts. Quinn had this crazy urge to pull those shorts right down in the middle of Lucky's Market because that's what he deserved, but she restrained herself. She said, I'm moving today. Yeah, Ethan nodded like a floppy-haired bobblehead. I heard something like that. Is there anything you want to say to me before I go? I, she opened her arms wide. Here's your chance. Um, he said, looking around like he was afraid someone might see him talking to G.I. Jane and think he was a loser. It's just you and me, Ethan, Quinn said quietly. For a second, she let herself remember the first five minutes in Paige's bathroom when the two of them had been talking and laughing, and she'd actually hoped he would kiss her. Look, Quinn, he said, I'm, dude. Suddenly, it wasn't just the two of them. John Coogler appeared out of nowhere. The same John Coogler who just days before had ripped the Colorado Rockies cap off Quinn's head in the middle of the assembly and started a game of keep away. What are you doing with the head, John smirked. Coming back for more? Yeah, Ethan muttered right. Dude, John held out his hand for a high five. Wow, John, Quinn had said, her voice thick with sarcasm. You're such a nice guy. You're both such nice guys. I hope all the boys in Massachusetts are just like you. She walked away to the sound of them cracking up, and even though she could tell Ethan was only fake laughing, and she believed that he would have apologized if John hadn't shown up, it still hurt. Even now, when Quinn McAvoy of Goldshead, Massachusetts thought about Ethan Hess or John Coogler or Sammy Alby or Paige or Tara or any of the girls on her basketball team, her stomach felt as holy, like has holes in it, not holy as in the Holy Spirit, as a hunk of Swiss cheese. Especially on days like today when dermatologists and stupid t-shirts told her there was nothing to be done about her bald head. The dark thoughts swirled. What if the wig tape doesn't stick? What if Guinevere comes flying off? What if everything that happened in Boulder repeats itself all over again? These were the what ifs playing on the screen in Quinn's brain when she passed a set of double doors leading into a room filled with light. The entire back wall was windows. Scattered all around were those brightly colored exercise balls, like the one Quinn's mom used to bounce Julius up and down on when he was a baby. There were a few people working out on weight machines, a blonde woman lying on a cushioned table, a boy about the same age as Julius holding onto two wooden bars, taking halting steps forward on short metal legs. It took a few seconds for Quinn to register. She knew the boy. He was not the same age as Julius. His legs were just really short. 
Who is it? Even though he was concentrating on the floor in front of him, he must have sensed her standing in the doorway because he looked up and froze. Quinn knew without Nick Strout saying a word that he wanted to run or evaporate, whichever one would make him disappear faster. This was the moment where if Quinn were brave, she would rip off, rip Guinevere off her head and say, those are your legs? Well, this is my head. But she couldn't do it. She and Nick weren't friends yet. Not really. In the weeks since his Instagram apology, things had improved. She would admit that. They say hi to each other in study hall now. Once when Quinn asked Nick for a post-it, he gave her one. But that was all. Even Quinn's friendship with Ivy and Carmen and Lissa was too new, too unpredictable for her to bear all. Maybe there would be some magical moment in the future. Once she'd gotten to know everyone better, once she knew she could trust them, but not here, not now. Now Quinn would do something encouraging, but far less dramatic than ripping off her wig. She would give Nick Strout a thumbs up, and then she would hightail it out of there. Well, at least it wasn't a negative interaction between the two of them. It would take a lot of courage to just take your wig off right there in the middle of a probably a physical therapy room is what I'm inferring and say, here it is. I mean, you don't know if you can trust him. And most of their interactions until the apology had been negative and he'd been rude. So, you know, you're still going to have that in the back of your mind. I hope you guys are enjoying this story. I hope you're thinking and inferring ahead of what you think will happen and things like that. Anyway, enjoy your weekend. Enjoy your Friday. Have a fantastic, fabulous Friday. Enjoy the weekend, and I will see you guys back here on Monday. Bye.